dude, really? Someone posted, I used to think you were clever. No idea what gave him that idea. Look up the CIA document called The Adam and Eve Story. So I did. There is indeed a CIA document called The Adam and Eve Story, and the reason we know about it, apparently, is because it was declassified about ten years ago. It describes a looming catastrophe that's about to destroy civilization, and it's the latest conspiracy theory circulating the blogosphere. Coincidentally, someone else posted a link to a video analysing the same document. It's from our old friend Ben Davidson, who runs a YouTube channel called Suspicious Observers. We're going to look at the science behind this in a minute, but first I'll let Ben read the CIA document that describes what humanity is about to experience. With a rumble so low as to be inaudible, growing, then fuming into a thundering roar, what about throbbing? the earthquake starts. Only it's not like any earthquake in recorded history. In California, the mountains shake like ferns in a breeze. The mighty Pacific rears back and piles up into a mountain of water more than two miles high, then starts its race eastward. Hang on, sorry to interrupt, but all of this has apparently been classified by the CIA. It reads more like a George R. Stewart novel. Thousand mile an hour winds, a sea of white hot liquid fire, two mile high waves of water, and... Survivors there marvel at the sun standing still in the sky for nearly half a day. Eastern Siberia, Manchuria, China, and Burma are subjected to the same annihilation as South America. Wind, earth fire, inundation, and freezing. The Bay of Bengal Basin, just east of India, is now at the North Pole. The Pacific Ocean, just west of Peru, is at the South Pole. The atmosphere and oceans, refusing to change direction with the Earth's shell, have wiped out almost all life. Um, but the Adam and Eve story, the theory of that is that these, it happens in cycles of 6,500 years and that it's a 90 degree flip, but six days later, or on the seventh day, it corrects itself. The and planet a, flips, not it, just the... It, it, that, correct. It's a, it's a planet flip, 90 degree, and that because of it, the Earth essentially does a standstill. The sun will be direct, will basically stay in the same spot, causing heating like we've never experienced. And that the wind and the waters continue with their momentum. Because essentially the wind travels at approximately 1,000 miles an hour at the equator. So the theory is that when that event happens, it's going to be cataclysmic. If not for the fact that it was classified by the CIA, it might be worth ignoring entirely as science fiction. Well then, let me put you all out of your misery. It wasn't classified. This isn't a CIA document. It's a book by a little-known electrical engineer called Chan Thomas. Ben Davidson does mention this much further into his video. The only thing that was classified was a single copy of the book that was held by the CIA. I found a colour photocopy of the original third edition, the same edition the CIA had, posted by someone on a conspiracy forum. It shows this publication history starting in 1963. A so-called postlude was published in 1971. The book seems to be self-published because Emerson House doesn't appear to be anything in the publishing business other than a name, and the book has been put together with staples. It was never classified, it was publicly available, and even reprinted in 1993. The CIA simply classified a copy of the third edition which it had in its possession. The only thing that seems to be sensitive is the name of the donor which was blanked out. But the CIA only released 57 pages of the original 284-page manuscript. But 57 pages are all that was in the 1965 edition, which is what the CIA had in its possession. That's evident by looking at the actual book and simply counting the page numbers. They go up to 55, and then there are two blank pages. Even with the CIA copy, it's pretty easy to count the pages all the way to the end. Whatever the case, even Ben Davidson admits, everyone has been free to read it. The postlude of Chan's work was not part of the sanitized release by the CIA, but it was included in a 1993 version of the book the CIA apparently didn't feel the need to classify. Right. Not only that, Chan Thomas's source material isn't some new scientific discovery, it's... The Bible. One entire chapter... A fifth of the book is simply a retranslation of Genesis. 
and the rest is mostly religious arguments about how past mythical religious figures were actually real people who died at each successive cataclysm. If not for the fact that it was classified by the CIA, it might be worth ignoring entirely as science fiction. Right, so since this was a publicly available book, only the copy in the CIA's possession was classified, that leaves us with, as Ben Davidson says, something that resembles science fiction and can be ignored. And in the past, we would have ignored people who stood on the street ranting about the end of the world and quoting the Bible. I'm here today to tell you that the Bible has told us what it looks like for the world to end. No one would have put them on a pedestal or called their beliefs theories on a par with atomic theory and the theory of universal gravitation. Back then, people simply ignored a cheap homemade book by someone using the Bible to prove the imminent collapse of civilization and global disasters. Since when did we start giving them so much credence? The answer is when the world of internet blogging began. This, Jen, is the internet. <laughs> I went back looking for references to the book on the internet year by year since the CIA declassified its copy in 2013. And apart from bookseller references, I couldn't find anything until early 2019 when it started popping up on YouTube and conspiracy forums. Then in April that year, the Mail Online got hold of it and splashed the headline, Jesus was a scholar who lived in India and was picked up by a UFO on Easter Sunday claims a newly published book that was classified by the CIA for over 50 years. And the Mail showed excerpts. In the past, the Daily Mail wouldn't have bothered with a 60-year-old book rambling on about the Bible, the end of civilization, and the sun standing still in the sky. It would have been a waste of newsprint. But thanks to the Internet, there's now unlimited space. The Mail Online can flood its website with all kinds of stories and then wait to see which ones generate clicks and which don't. In this case, it was a hit. But while gods and biblical characters are the most important sources in the book, there is an attempt to find some science to support it, even if you have to reach back to a discarded belief, again based on the Bible, from the 18th century. There are others who walk with us, writes Thomas men of science, who first saw that these cataclysmic catastrophes have happened before, countless times. OK, so why did André de Luc in 1779 and Georges Cuvier in 1812 think the Earth has been through a number of cataclysms? Well, let's suppose you were educated in the 18th century and knew almost nothing about geology because the science was still in its infancy. All you knew was that the rocks around you seemed to have been laid down on the seabed and then lifted out of the water, tilted, folded and shattered. Then other layers of marine sediment were neatly piled on top of them. If you had to make all this fit the Bible, how would you interpret that? It wouldn't be a bad guess to suppose that a series of catastrophic upheavals had suddenly befallen the rocks underneath. A huge global flood had covered everything, depositing layers of marine sediment on top, and then the flood waters had receded. That idea of a global cataclysm became known as catastrophism, and in the 18th century it fit perfectly with the Bible and a belief in a young earth. Chan Thomas cites Georges Cuvier's book, The Theory of the Earth, as evidence of catastrophism. But Cuvier formed his so-called theory based on his belief that the Earth was young. In a chapter titled The History of Nations Confirms the Newness of the Continents, he claimed that the continents can only be around 5,000 years old because, according to written records, that's how long the oldest humans have inhabited them. But that belief was challenged by natural philosophers who thought the processes shaping mountains and rock formations might have been very slow. And that was based on evidence. After all, we can observe these slow processes today. For example, the slow wearing away of rocks into sand and silt carried by rivers down to the sea, the slow deposition of mud, silt and sand into layers on the seabed. Even what seemed like catastrophic events, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, only made small incremental changes, moving the earth by a few feet or adding another layer of rock or ash to the side of a volcano. So they reasoned that if the Earth was millions of years old, not just a few thousand, 
then these slow, incremental changes we see could easily account for rock formations without needing sudden biblical catastrophes. This new school of thought became known as uniformitarianism, with its slogan, The present is the key to the past. Over the next 200 years, more and more evidence was found that clearly sided with uniformitarianism and easily disproved the biblical version of the Earth's history. Modern instruments show that the supposed catastrophes we see in rocks, folding, faulting and uplift, didn't happen in a matter of days. They took place slowly over millions of years. Precise satellite measurements show that mountain chains like the Himalayas and the Alps are rising by a few millimetres a year, and over millions of years these tiny movements add up to several kilometres. Instruments on the ground can measure the rate at which crustal plates are moving, and if we rewind all that slow and incremental movement over millions of years, the continental plates come together perfectly, matching in terms of time, geography, stratigraphy and paleontology. It's fascinating reading the words of people decades or centuries ago trying to figure out the mechanism for things they saw that we now understand, like accounts by 17th century physicians discussing the cause of the plague. Was it foul air, or a curse from God, an imbalance of humours, a bad alignment of the stars? Could it be cured with posies of sweet-smelling flowers, or nutmeg? You feel you want to go back in time and yell, No! It's a bacterium called Yersinia pestis that's passed from rats to humans via fleas. Please forget the posies. Control the rats. But wouldn't it be odd if people started abandoning everything we've learned about bacteria and antibiotics and epidemiology and went back to believing that disease is spread by bad air or an imbalance of humours? simply because that's what everyone believed 300 years ago. Well, OK, nothing would surprise me in the internet age, but it wouldn't be all that smart. And yet, Ben Davidson tries to provide evidence to substantiate Thomas's belief in 18th century catastrophism. Well, when I say evidence, I mean he read another book. This one involves an expedition by a certain Major White, written by his son, Ken White. Major Maynard E. White led the first mission to map and understand the Arctic region, mostly because of navigational concerns and a monitor for Soviet attacks over the pole. They found evidence of marine strata, lifted to significant altitude, time after time, and with tropical corals found in that Arctic region yeah, strata... Sorry to interrupt again, but there's really no need to dig up an old book about an expedition to Spitsbergen to convince anyone that marine sediments have been uplifted. Major White probably didn't know it, because that isn't his field, but uplift was pretty basic geology back in 1947. Even in 1847, it's been known about and written about for over two centuries. Just look around you. If you're on dry land, chances are you're sitting on uplifted marine sediments. Look at any geological map. Most rocks, including the mountain chains, are uplifted marine sediments. As for tropical fossils found in cold climates, again, this has been known for centuries. It was nothing new or controversial, even in 1947. On Spitsbergen itself, there were numerous geological expeditions that went there long before Major White and recorded, documented and mapped uplifted sediments and out-of-place fossil corals. The difference is that in 1947 no one knew how marine sediments had been uplifted or why fossil coral is found in high latitudes. The forces that have created mountains have remained a mystery, wrote White, presumably relaying the thoughts of his father. And yet there has to be an explanation for high strata of mountain rock containing marine fossils. Some tremendous force had to lift up the land with such pressure so as to raise former seabeds to high altitudes. And we know what that force was. It's our old friend plate tectonics. Pieces of crust are slowly driven round the earth by currents of molten rock in the upper mantle, a bit like the moving crust of this magma lake. We can see through seismology how these pieces of crust are moving today, colliding in places like South Asia and throwing up the Himalayas, or subducting one under another, uplifting mountain chains like the Andes. And this didn't suddenly start happening 50 years ago when it was discovered. The evidence from the geological record 
shows it's been going on for billions of years. How can we explain the once temperate climate of this Arctic region, asked White, unless either the whole Earth was once warmer than it is now, or unless the poles were previously in different locations relative to the Earth's crust? Well, we explain it quite easily with the very obvious third option that he doesn't mention, that Spitsbergen's crustal plate, like all crustal plates, has moved over time and was once in the tropics. If we wind back the paleogeographical map, we see exactly that. Spitsbergen, in the red circle, can be traced from its current position all the way back to its location on the edge of a shallow tropical sea around 400 million years ago. And yet non-scientists are constantly amazed when they learn about fossils on mountaintops and think they've discovered something extraordinary. And here's the wild thing is that in that document it says uh, a continental-sized tsunami being two miles high. Well, I showed you the Emikusi volcano in Africa and the Sahara, which is at 11,300 feet, that has salt as well as evidence of gastropods, sea life. That's two miles high. Yes. So how did salt and gastropods, sea life, as Jimmy Corsetti calls it, end up two miles high in the crater of a volcano far inland? Clearly a two-mile-high tsunami, just like the book says. But of course there is another explanation, the scientific one, and it's a shame you rarely get to hear scientific explanations on the Joe Rogan experience. In this case, the reason isn't uplifted sediments, because Emikusi is an extinct volcano. The reason is that during the early Holocene, there was a freshwater lake in the crater, because the Sahara was much wetter back then. Salts from gases venting out of the volcano dissolved in the lake, and tiny gastropods lived along its shoreline for thousands of years. When the climate dried, the lake evaporated, the gastropods died, and the salts were precipitated out. So why did Jimmy Corsetti think this had something to do with the sea? Well, this is where it gets a bit odd. Here's a tweet from Corsetti where he identifies his source. Well, not quite, but by googling chunks of text, it was quite easy to find his source. He lifted all this from Wikipedia. On the right, he sums up what he thinks Wikipedia says about the two-mile-high crater in just four words. Salt, water erosion, and gastropods. But hang on a minute, the article is a lot more nuanced than that. Let's read it without the photo Corsetti has planted on top. It's not salt in the crater, according to Wikipedia. It says salts, and there's a difference. To most people, salt means sodium chloride, table salt or sea salt. But in science, the word salts, plural, refers to ionic compounds. And in this case, the salts are sodium carbonates, as the Wikipedia page clearly states. He also missed the bit that said the presence of gastropods was evidence that the crater was once home to a lake. So these weren't marine gastropods at all. They were freshwater animals living in a lacustrine, a lake, environment. Corsetti not only didn't read the page he's showing as evidence, he didn't check any of the references either. The information on the gastropods takes us to this paper, freely available on the internet, confirming that the gastropods lived in a lake about 300 metres deep. Fossilised caraphytes, freshwater lake-dwelling vegetation, were also found around the crater. So when Corsetti reduced all this to four simple words, it's hard to believe he was deliberately trying to deceive people, because after all, he's put the information showing his error right next door albeit partially obscured. But if a guy who majored in sociology and communications, with a minor in religion and an MBA focusing on marketing, sets himself up as an independent researcher in science, surely it's not too much to ask that he at least reads the Wikipedia page he's citing as evidence. No one who commented bothered to move their eyes slightly to the left to read Corsetti's source either, that seems to be too much trouble. I've arranged for the people of Australia to join hands tonight and spell out your name with candles. There's a satellite hookup on that monitor if you'll just turn your head slightly. Bah, no time. Next! Now that we've established from Corsetti's own source that this was a freshwater lake and not the sea, we don't have to do any of those complicated fluid dynamics calculations to work out how high a tsunami had to be 
to travel over a thousand miles inland and still end up two miles high. Eh, I doubt if Corsetti did the calculations either. As for Major White, he can be forgiven for not knowing why he found fossils on mountain tops, because his expedition was in 1947, decades before plate tectonics was understood. He was simply reporting what he saw. But his son had no such excuse. His claims that they were still a mystery in 1994 was obvious nonsense. Even if you disagree with plate tectonics for some bizarre religious, ideological or moral reason, it's dishonest and inaccurate to claim that scientists in 1994 couldn't agree on whether the uplift was slow or rapid. Ben Davidson and other YouTubers have even less excuse because... OK, Ben's a lawyer and not a geologist, but these days you don't need to read a geology textbook to learn about plate tectonics. The answers are just a mouse click away. So in order to follow their logic, we need to get into the blogosphere bubble and ignore all the scientific discoveries of the 21st and the 20th century and the 19th century and subscribe to beliefs that prevailed in the 18th century. OK, let's go with that. Now we need to look at the mechanism the bloggers and the vloggers have come up with to explain it. As the Americans say, it's a doozy, but it'll have to wait until my next video. So in part two, I'll look at how they think the Earth flipped over onto its side and explore the idea that the Earth's magnetic field switches polarity every few thousand years and causes cataclysms and extinctions. Are we overdue for another one? Will it bring the apocalypse? So what's the science behind this complete reversal of the magnetic pole? We'll sort the science from the science fiction and along the way look at magnetic signatures in rocks. So I hope you'll stay tuned for that. But to bring us back full circle, no, I'm not clever. I came bottom of my class at school. But you don't have to come top of the class to debunk this blogosphere claptrap. Anyone can do it, it's just that the people who peddle this stuff, for whatever reason, choose not to.